from WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington. Welcome to the Kojo Nam, the show connecting your neighborhood with the world. Voices of Dissent in Ethiopia. It's America's strongest ally in East Africa. From W. A crucial role in regional conflicts in Somalia and South Sudan, Ethiopia is also America's largest aid recipient in Africa, taking in nearly $400 million in 2012. Then there are the 250,000 Ethiopian residents living in this region. So it's fair to say that conversations we have here in Washington about Ethiopia are inherently and intensely local. Earlier this month, I spent nine days exploring the country with the international humanitarian agency CARE, accompanied by two of the show's producers. While much of the focus was on poverty and food aid, we thought it was important to have on-the-record conversations about politics. Turns out, that's not so easy. The government commands an overwhelming majority in the parliament after what critics say was a very tightly controlled election in 2010. Since then... Several opposition leaders have been jailed, as have been a number of journalists. And aid groups have clear orders to stay out of politics. But we wanted to bring you voices that are less often heard. So, today we bring you a conversation with a trio of opposition bloggers we met in Addis Ababa. Soliana Shemelis, Bifekadu Hailu, and Abel Wabella, who write for the website Zone 9. Here is their story starting with the origins of their blog. We started it like we used to have different kinds of voices in social media. It to have different voices, but it was not much organized, so we thought, like, if we, if we come up with some kind of organized or network blogging, if we could have our voices together so that we can make it like more convincing and more we can address so many people, more people. So we started it before one year in around eight months. And when you say, so we could bring our voices together... Exactly whose voices are you talking about? The voices of people who are interested in democracy? Yeah, the voice of people who are interested in democracy, freedom of expression, and most of us who come up with this network or blog are a kind of individual activists who have been talking about democracy, human rights, freedom of expression. So we thought, like, if we could bring this together, we can address so many people together. How did you get involved? Uh, I had my own blog and uh, I used to uh, do activism on social medias. So uh, then uh, we uh, talked about it and came up with the same blog on which nine of us write so that our you know, dispersed voices or even audiences come together and uh, to make our influence wider than before. How did you get involved? Before joining our group, Zone, I have been blogging by myself. I was alone. I was mentioning some facts. Some journalists tried to sympathize the government. So I said, I start to blog to say Zone Zero. So at that time, when I, I uh, explain myself on the social media, I have got many friends who has not exactly the same, but positive impact for the democratization of Ethiopia. So I joined that group. What are your concerns about democracy and freedom of expression under the current government? The first concern is the situation of freedom of expression is deterring from time to time. Since 2005, we lost so many medias, and we know the post-2005 controversy and all those things happening was very shocking and after that we came up with the, the other election in 2010 and that election was a completely different from the 2005 one. It was quiet and silent and at the same time we, we are keeping keeping losing so many medias including the, the very influential ones at Disneyker and so we were really frustrated at the time when we started this blog that things are getting very worse and we should come up with something at least to keep our inspiration. So I think our first concern is the situation of freedom of expression as deteriorating from time to time and that indirectly affected all over the democracy, the rights, the civil rights situations in the country. Do you think that the reason that the election in 2010 was so quiet was because of a lack of freedom of expression, was because so much media had been closed down? I think it will have a significant impact, yeah. The closing of medias and the situation of the press 
really affect the result of the 2010 election. But there are so many other components. But basically, I think that part also contributed a lot. Yes. What is the manner in which, in your opinion, the government goes about stifling freedom of expression? And you can offer as many facts as you choose. Yeah, I think it's really difficult to put it in such a way, but basically, since in, in the last 22 years, I think it's around 76 million we lost. Yeah, 76 it, it's, it's actually more than that, but the ones who, mm-hmm. who were operating... Yeah. Uh, In the last 22 years, you're saying you've lost some 76 media outlets? Yeah, media outlets, yeah. No, we only have like a couple of magazines maybe and a couple of newspapers. And now currently, again, election is coming and the situation is getting very worse. And in the last few weeks, we have been listening to different kinds of facts that those magazines and newspapers are uh, voices of the extreme political activities. So therefore, they should behave and something like that. So... In the coming one year in four months, we're going to have another election, and we're afraid it's going to be similar to the thousand things. Was that very quiet, silent, and things going to be like this. things going to keep like this the way they used to? Now your blog has been banned; it's not available here yeah. in Ethiopia. When did that happen? It happened after we opened our first blog. After two weeks, we opened after the first blog, so we started like keeping having another site and migrating all the data as we used to have in the first one, but we, we, we can't do that every time. We try seven or eight times, then after we get tired because it's a click away to do that and it's going to be very difficult for us to migrate all the files, all the communication from one side to another side. So we just try to use other opportunities of using social media, trying to tweak the ideas and trying to bring all the contents of our blogs to, the, to the, our Facebook page. but. The other difficulty was that the Facebook page was also filtered. So you can access Facebook, but you can't access our page specifically. So what we tried to do was we, sh- we tried to change the URL so that people can access it. And we tried to change the blocked one by replacing the other one, but it's really difficult to access our sites here. But we can't do anything more than that. But the government obviously knows that you're still doing the blog. The government obviously knows that you're still posting on Facebook. Does that cause you to fear, to have any fear at all about this? One of the struggles we are trying uh, to do is uh, challenging the fear in itself. There are always rumors from insiders that we are going to be jailed the next time we are writing something or we are uh, coming up with some sort of campaigns uh, that we have done earlier. So fear is always there, but uh, you can't help challenging it because, you know, uh, quitting uh, cannot be the solution. We have seen that. I guess spokespersons for the government would argue that, well, it's not as bad as it was under the Derg. It's much better now. What would you say? They try to do something in democracy. They call it democracy, whatever, but they try to do something. But you, you, you don't need to compare Heidegger versus Lassie with other Bekele. Bekele ran for before 40 years ago. Anyone can beat any then athlete can beat Abubikila on this time. So their performance is outdated below all major standard sales index. One of the, the questions that we have raised on the social medias, on uh, the, campaigns, the campaigns we have launched, is that uh, respect the constitution. It is a call for the government. And we say that because the constitution actually gives the opportunity for people to enjoy democracy. But practically, that is not applicable. Uh, So, yes, this regime has made uh, progresses, at least in writing those rights in the Constitution, but it's not practical, that's our question, especially in the years after the 2005 elections, election, then uh, things got worse. So we are asking to get our rights that are written on the Constitution. The government would also make the argument that the economy is improving under its leadership and that if there is too much democracy, then we spend all of our time fighting and arguing and we make no progress. How would you respond? Yes, the economy is progressing and I think that's the responsibility of every government. I mean, every government should do on the economy, every government should do on the democracy, every government should do on the civil and political rights. 
and the other argument, but the other argument of like spending much time on democracy, the democratic debates, and something like that is kind of funny because, I mean, everybody is not going to do that. People have the right to access to information. People have the right to access to talk about any civil and political rights. And if they do have the access, they're not going to have such a serious debate because they already know it. But the problem is you don't know it now. You don't have, you don't have information. Therefore, you you will spend much of your time to have information to argue with the people who restrict you not to have such informations. I think the restriction by itself brings kind of more discussions, more spending more time on such issues. But if things are really available there, if information is already there, and if the space to have information, to access information, and to talk and to discuss is already there. I think people will, will start to focus on their own things and their own commitment so that I think the debate is also important. And uh, But your debate is going to be like the debate that will contribute to your own causes, your own contributions. But this time, I think one of the effects of having such authoritarian regime is that you spend much of your time in talking about your rights, in talking about your freedom, in talking about your democracy. So you'll spend much of the time here, and you, you will not have the real time to contribute on what you exactly worked on, what you exactly learned, or something like that. Yeah. What gets publicized most in the United States is when journalists are arrested and jailed, but not much else. We don't hear much else about how democracy might be undermined here in Ethiopia. What would you like people listening to you in the United States to know, in addition to the fact that there are are journalists who have been jailed. People's uh, participation in, in civil activities has dramatically decreased, but nobody writes that because, you know, my participation uh, and failure to participate is not something visible. It is something that I decide personally. So uh, a journalist or a newspaper cannot make a story out of that. But we are living it, you know. Uh, sometimes you feel that you are uh, excluded from uh, public uh, services and even, you know, you don't participate because, you know, the democracy, the kind of democracy practiced in Ethiopia, which is revolutionary, doesn't allow you to give uh, your opinions unless and otherwise working towards what is said by the incumbent. So, you know, the lack of uh, or the failure to participate and people are migrating like hell, I don't know. Uh, why are all these people leaving their country behind? Every friend of mine wants to leave Ethiopia every chance he or she gets. That is the lack of democracy that is driving my friends out of the country. They are giving up in the democracy. They are giving up in the election that is coming. They know that changes are not going to be made. They know that they don't have a voice to contribute for the development. You know, it cannot be in their way. It only will be performed in the way that the government wants. What are the consequences of openly opposing the government? There are two categories. One, you'll be just like journalists or you, re, you have got a chance with me, escape you, you re exile. The other one is you are very systematically out of form the system of all opportunities of the country. You will not get education opportunity, you will not get a, a public service. Everything systematically will be out of the system, will be an alien on your country. Has the government, outside of not making your blog available in Ethiopia, how has the government attempted to retaliate against you for the work that you do? Intimidations from different individuals, actually. But they will act like it's based on their individual capacity, but we know that they do have some other intentions behind. And the, the level of intimidation differs from time to time. It's increasing in the last few months, because I think, because the election is coming, and that somehow affected what we are doing currently now, and uh, I think that happened after the campaign that we did on the demonstration, the right to demonstration, that was our third campaign. And after that, I think things are getting very serious, and we know that we're we're kind of feeling the heat that things are getting very tight on us. When you say they started getting very serious, 
What do you mean by that? What did they start the doing? Increase, the intimidation increases from time to time. People who are going to up, write something for you to stop to quit what you are doing is increasing. And there are different signals like communicating other people around, telling them that in, talking with online, having an interaction with group is kind of having uh, something illegal, something criminal. So they will try to give them a different signals around so that you guys should take care, kind of signals you guys should take care and you guys should somehow refrain from what you are doing. Do you feel the government is spying on you? Uh, actually, I am pretty sure about about that. How? Uh, surveillance. It is usually through our cyber activities that we affect them, I mean, or uh, influence against, uh, I mean, we put our influence against them through the cyber, so they do that through uh, their technologies. And I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, there are a lot of um, information that I have. Uh, I don't actually tell you everything, uh, because there might be people involved in telling me that. but. I'm kind of sure about that. I mean, uh, we are all spied. Uh, even the blockage of our blog indicates that every time we have created a new blog, it will be blocked a few hours after after the new blog has created. Knowing that the government does not approve of what you're doing, what inspires you to continue doing it? You know, we, we live in a repression. We are part of the repression. So it's not something, an ideology uh, you learn in school. It's a day-to-day life we live in. Plus, we'll pay a visit to um, arrest journalists and political prisoners. They pay a lot. They have their own family, they have their own life, but for the cause of people, they are in prison. So to inspire us, we'll go on weekends there. Then we'll discuss with them. Some things they will inspire us, but they say, Berto. Berto means in America, be brave. That's it. This is a government that came into power and came into office against a very repressive regime. Are you therefore surprised that this government is engaging in what you call the suppression of freedom of expression? Does that surprise you? Yes, of course. Obviously, I mean, on the first five, maybe six years, up to ten years, the situations were much better than now. On the first few years of EPRD, things were very good, and we had so many publications. At least we do have a very good constitution, which is one of the best constitutions in the world. So it granted, it's granted all the basic rights, democratic and freedom of expression and other related rights and civil and political rights. And I think it was really progressive in the first few years, and now it's very surprising that things are getting back to the last, before the the regime came, but that means like going back to going back again 22 years. This is a government that has assisted the United States and other powers in Somalia. This is a government that is involved in peace talks in South Sudan. This is a government that is the headquarters of the African Union. Do you think that because of these international commitments, if you will, the government gets a pass on what you say is its repression? Is the government getting good public relations because of these things, as a result of which the rest of the world is not looking very closely at what this government does internally, that we are so focused on what this government is doing in the region and on the continent, that we're not looking at what it's doing internally? Yeah, uh, the same uh, was true for uh, previous regimes. Uh, However, the previous regime specifically, the Mengistus regime, was not as friendly as this one to the U.S. It was friendly to many, and it was still good for African countries, you know. So uh, Ethiopian leaders usually uh, are friends of anyone who is an outsider, but... Internally, they they do oppressions. Every one of them oppress their people. Uh, so they uh, make sure that no voice that affects their relation with foreigners or foreign countries has come out from the country. So the the 
foreign countries, usually their allies, the strongest allies like US, don't usually care about what is happening inside because, you know, they are friendly and they do whatever is good for uh, foreign countries. Of course, I somehow support the, this, uh, I mean, foreign relation, it's good, but they also have to be democratic and friendly to their own people. And I think the stability, the Ethiopia being a stable country in the Horn of Africa contributes a lot for the support from the international community. But what's not noted well is that the internal situation, the internal repression might, what might in the near future create another unstable country in the Horn of Africa, which is Ethiopia itself. Therefore, I think considering the internal situation, the internal civil, civil and political rights and the democratization situation is really important because it might in the near future affect, bring another unstable country and which will indirectly affect the, the support from the international community. But that's one thing that was missed by the international community. The international community supports the Ethiopian government. It gives different kinds of funding. So Ethiopia is one of the the, the number one countries who have been receiving different funding from the U.S. and the other international communities, but all the supports came because it appears it's a stable country and it's a stable ally to the Horn of Africa. But in the near future, in the coming few years, if the internal repression is keeping back this, it by, by itself might become one of the unstable countries around here. And that's why we need to focus on the internal democratization process too. We'll continue our conversation with pro-democracy bloggers in Ethiopia after a break. I'm Kojon Andi. Welcome back. We're talking with bloggers we met with in Addis Ababa, Soliana Shemelis, Bifakadu Hailu, and Abel Wabella, who write for the website Zone 9. Well, we talked about journalists, but in 2005, there was a vibrant and vocal opposition. In 2010, much less so. What, in your view, does the government do to, I guess, suppress its parliamentary opposition? There's only one you know, opposition parliamentary member. <laughs> That's true. He, 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 he tries, he's a good person. He tries to do uh, a lot, but one person is only one. I he doesn't have much impact. Yeah. I think the change after 2005 was the one with civil society proclamation. The civil society was very vibrant before 2005. They do have the role in the 2005 election. They do have this kind of network, the civil society uh, for 2005 election kind of network, who had been very active in monitoring elections, talking about elections, and in also mobilizing voters around the ele- before the 2005 election. So after the 2005 election, I think in 2009, there was a draft of civil society proclamation which denies the access to the civil society to get fund- more than of ten- more than 10% of their fundings should not come from foreign resources if they're working on human rights, water rights, human rights monitoring, and capacity building for journalists and any other things related with human rights and advocacy. And I think that law started to be implemented since 2010, January 2010, and that was sig- that significantly affected the role of civil society, which was the, which the impact was really seen on 2010 election. And the second one is, I think, the, anti-pro- the anti-terrorism law, which was also enacted in 2009 and started to be implemented in 2010. The anti-terrorism law do have this kind of very ambigu- ambiguous words and ambiguous clauses, which c- which could be used like widened and narrowed to the different context that the government wants to serve for. It will make anybody potentially a terrorist, and it's really easy for anyone to be labeled as terrorist or not. And it depends, it doesn't depend on the law, but it depends on the interpretation of the law. And that creates a significant fear on the on the journals, on the, on the, on the journalism, the freedom of expression experiences, and also somewhat to the civil society and the individual activists and activists who have been doing. And I think the other one is, there were some media laws which have been also enacted after 2005 election, which limits the right of the ownership of the media owners. For example, you can't have a newspaper and a, a magazine at the same time. You, you can't have two media houses at the same time. You can only have one media house, and it also limits the rights of the owners on having a different media outlets and something like that. And it significantly also affects the activities of the media. And in addition to that, there have been so many publications who would have been forced to go out from the the public the publication. We can't remember that after two thousand five, the only media who had been very vibrant was Addis Nagar, which 
all this era of two years and they were forced to flee from the country to exile because they had the information that they are going to be charged on the terrorism. Therefore, after losing Addis Negar, we only had two, two the new newspapers and we lost them before the election too. I think all those these measures like the laws, the repression, and having this, this is a series of laws who, who, who limit the international, the overall movement of the democratization process affects that includes the law for the electoral process. They, we do have another law for the election and how who is eligible to monitor elections. That also limits the role of the civil society. And this all in general brings the 2010 election, which is 99.6 win by the regime. Yeah, also the um, participation has been decreasing because since 2005 people somehow gave up that elections can make changes so those the number of those people who were registered to vote in 2010 was very low uh, and the ones who after registered go got to vote were even low so that that significantly affected the results of the election and many of those voted were friends and members of the ruling party, so it succeeded somehow. And there, were, there was also a rumor since, you know, the 2005 election ended badly. People were afraid that the government comes for revenge if we voted for uh, a different party. Uh, it's not going to give the power anyway, so it's better to keep the status quo as it is and be safe. Again, the government would make the argument that we live in a very dangerous zone. There's al-Shahab right next door to us. There is terrorism that's taking place in Kenya. And therefore, we need an anti-terrorism law that makes sure that that kind of thing doesn't happen here. And so far, we have been successful. How would you say that that anti-terrorism law limits freedom of expression for people who simply want to oppose policies of the government and for people who are in no way linked to terrorism. For example, giving an interview for foreign media is will make you potentially a terrorist. We are very courageous to be here. Yeah, of course. <laughs> for example, uh, one of the famous political prisoners in Kaliti, the Kaligarba, was arrested. After meeting officials of Amnesty International, so meeting with somebody else will make you a terrorist. Even if you drink a coffee with somebody else, with, with a suspect of terrorism, you, you are also a terrorist. So it's open for interpretation. It will put everybody else in that category if the government wants to uh, make you to silence you, they label you as a terrorist. That's happening on in OLF, the Ogaden Liberation Front, including Oromo Liberation Front. What I'm hearing here is that if and when this interview airs in Washington, D.C., that could make things more dangerous and more difficult for you. Why then are you doing this interview? As activists here, we are struggling. I mean, we are challenging the facts. For example, here, our government tries to, to make or to seem uh, lawful acts as criminal acts. So we have to challenge it by risking our own safety. That's, that's what we do. Uh, many journalists who are in prison now know in advance that the government comes after them for writing some of uh, the things that are, they are charged of. They knew it in advance and they are now in jails. Well, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that the government has to come and uh, <laughs> jail me so that I can uh, be silent, but, you know, uh, we have to tell our countrymates and even the world people that we have to challenge the factors, otherwise, things get worse. Giving interview is legal, and actually, that will that, that sometimes will make you automatically criminal in cases like Ethiopia. But I think by doing the exact legal legal thing, that's how we do the activism 
our campaign with respect to the Constitution, what we are trying to say was like the law gives us all the rights and we should exercise them. So if you are not doing it, who is going to do that? We are preaching all those things. So what you see yourselves doing here is merely exercising your rights yeah, exactly. under the Ethiopian Constitution. The Ethiopian Constitution. So it have its own risks. I mean, writing a blog to have its own risks. Doing the campaign to have its own risks. And we're doing that because it was legal. So we'll keep on doing legal things. And we hope that it will inspire some other people in the country and outside the country too. Plus we have been uh, writing on social media to our generation generally in to Ethiopian society to be courageous to ask your rights. If you fail to do that, why will it will be uh, morally unacceptable if you fail to do that. What I also hear you saying is that the government here seems to be enjoying a great deal of international support but is denying international support to 10% to any organization that is not a government organ organization. If, in fact, the government continues to get this kind of international support and continues to act in the way you say it is acting, what is your fear for the future of Ethiopia? The silence will increase, obviously. I mean, we're keeping silent for the last, like, eight years, since 2005. Everybody is silent, the civil society is silent, the media is getting very silent, individual activists are keeping silent. Therefore, I think in the coming years, we might not even get individuals talking about the government policy and talking the, critically talking about anything which the government did. And my fear is that everything will keep silent and we might even have some other ge coming generation who is really afraid of talking what's wrong in the neighborhood and in the road. Well, we live in Washington, D.C., a region that has a very large number of Ethiopians who live there. And when we do radio shows on Ethiopia or any international issue, we get a lot of calls and emails from people who are strongly opposed to the government here. How important is that kind of support to you? I personally want uh, their oppositions want to be in a manner of research it, but it's really important since some of uh, the the critical ideas they are raising are somewhat uh, weakened. We can't raise here for our uh, own safety. Their voices are very important, but we want also they to do that in a researched manner because they sometimes we go way out of line. Uh, we know that there are so many efforts in the diaspora in support of the critics and in the activism in the country, but that's really nice, that would be really nice and that will also contribute a lot if it gets somehow strategized. How about your own overseas travel? Is that restricted in any way? Not yet. <laughs> Have you traveled overseas yes. in recent years? We did. And you got you got out of and back into the country without yes. much of a problem? Yeah, so far we're good. But we traveled into two different reasons, into personal reasons, um, into meeting different individuals and groups for our own sake and sometimes as a group, but so far we're doing good. Yeah. What is your best hope for the future of your country? I hope uh, if our generation do so now, silence. We have a country which gave equal opportunity for all citizens. But if Pierre is still in power, there is no hope for it. I think the end of the silence is a very good hope. The end of the silence? Yeah, that would, that, that would be very That would be the, your wish for the future yeah. of Ethiopia? Yeah. Well, thank you all for thank you. visiting with us today. and. Hopefully we'll be hearing a lot more from you in the future.